You're now live. What a rookie. Gosh, can't even get the camera facing the right way. Oh well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to Instagram Live tonight with Bricks and Barrel. It is Wine Wednesday. Uh, yeah, apparently we're gonna keep doing this thing. So thanks for showing up and giving us a reason. Hold on one second. Because apparently I am now going into my middle age. I can't handle technology whatsoever. Guys, I am so excited about what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Uh, of course, we're gonna be talking about wine, but specifically, we're gonna be talking to Peter and Rebecca Work. Uh, their story is so great, as well as their wine, and it's something that I've been excited to talk about with you guys for a while. We've carried their wine for a few weeks now, but at the same time, carrying somebody's wine and learning about their wine is a little bit different, which is why all of us are missing tasting rooms so darn much right now. I feel like when we go to a tasting room, we get to drink the wine, enjoy it, but also really enjoy it more because we get to hear the story behind it. So I'm excited to talk to them tonight, but before I do, I wanna let you guys know that the wine we're talking about tonight is available on the site. And I would love for you guys to be able to buy it and enjoy it at home. I know a few of you guys were able to get the package beforehand and will be tasting with us at home. But guys, that's always something we try and do. Make this wine available so that you can connect with small wineries throughout California. So, you know, when it comes down to uh, the wines we're tasting tonight, if you love them, awesome. Put an order in. What we have are a few different packages as well as tiered pricing right now for shipping. So if you buy three bottles, it'll be $9.99 for overnight shipping. You buy six, it'll be $4 for overnight shipping. And if you buy more than that, say 12 bottles, it'll be free shipping. So it's something new that we're trying out, but we what I think we should probably be doing right now is actually talking to Peter and Rebecca. So I am going to try and bring them on and we're going to hear their story about how they were able to move from one side of the country, maybe even from another part of the world, and then come over to California to start making some amazing wine. As well as we might actually learn what biodynamic, organic, and sustainable means, especially to them and in the winemaking world. So um, with all that said, I'm going to try and bring them on at the same time. I know that they are now in a picturesque vineyard, so technology and beautiful views don't always go hand in hand. We'll see if we can't make this work relatively seamlessly. So uh, in the meantime, please let me know what you guys are enjoying. Let me know uh, if you guys might be enjoying some Amplus tonight. Uh, maybe something different. Maybe a really, really nice <gasps> guys you're there how are you <laughs> i can only guess that those are rebecca's fingers uh, no. <laughs> hey how's it going it's going well how are you doing? And, uh i said it before but hey thank you for coordinating um wearing your aloha shirt as i wear my aloha shirt only because in california i think at least where we are, it's finally getting to feel a lot like summer. Is that how it feels down there in Lompoc? 91 degrees high today. A friend of mine out in Sacramento had 102. So, you know, it's a little bit warmer there, but it's really nice here right now. No so, way. thank you so much for putting us on the show. We can't wait to do this. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Guys, you know, honestly, this, this is uh, not all, um, I guess, my credit. Uh, Amanda from uh, JNL, she has been such a huge advocate for you guys, and she has been able to preach the good news of what you guys are doing, and it was hard to ignore her, and I'm so glad I didn't, because she's been able to introduce me to your story, as well as uh, a few of your wines that have blown me away, but I, I know I could talk quite a bit. I really wanted to ask you guys, though, would you mind telling, like, all of us, like, okay, you've probably told it a number of times, but how did you start making wine in California. Well, so, okay. you know, before we get into that, <laughs> here's the thing I just want to start with. First of all, Peter Work, we're back at work. Where we are now is we're out in the vineyards. And the reason why I want to start with that is because the sun set about eight minutes ago. So it's going to get pretty quickly dark. So we're going to start out by doing it out here, Trevor. And as soon as nobody can see us any longer, we're going to sneak into the house and then continue in there. Right? I think that works. Especially for the rest of us that have to live vicariously through you, being able to watch as much as we can uh, this view as the sun sets, it, it really, it, it, it works for us. So you do whatever you have to do. So the way 
way this whole story started, amphilos means vine in Greek. And the reason for the name is twofold. We don't want to get thirsty either, so it's twofold. So it means vine in Greek. And the reason is two things. First off, it's all about the vineyard. It's kind of Peter's and my job not to mess it up when we make the wine. So we're the first vineyard in the U.S. to be certified organic, biodynamic, and sustainable. But the other oh reason is we were married in Greece and have a bed and breakfast in Greece. And so yeah. that's kind of the So it starts out many years ago when we started dating, started hanging out together. We love to go to the wine country, yeah. Napa, Sonoma, Temecula, and of course Santa Barbara County. We live down Los Angeles. I would love to come up here. It's only a couple of hours drive. And then uh, what happened was that we were doing a startup company down Los Angeles. We're talking 1999, quite a few years ago. And it took off like crazy, went really well. We did an IPO on it. But in the meantime... Don't forget about the book. In the meantime, <laughs> we had a little bit of some stock option money. Rebecca was an executive in MCI. I was in Walt Disney. And when we left to do the startup company, we were saying... What are we going to use these money for? And it like, started from yeah. the fact that he bought this book. I call it my most expensive book ever. And it was about the harvest of joy, Hamid Davi, when he was in his 80s, would get out, go into the vineyard, make decisions. It was a purpose that kept him going. And Peter comes huh. to me one day and says, wouldn't it be nice that we, isn't it romantic to have five acres and your dog's running through it kind of vineyard and give us a purpose when we're done with the corporate world? And that's kind of how that whole mindset, and we love Santa Barbara County. So we end up buying a piece of property. We were watching a great movie last night. There was a great line. There was a guy who said, money is not fun until you spend them, right? <laughs> so that's what we did. So we took some of our money, spent it. We bought, hard to see from here, but it's 82 acres of property okay. that we purchased in 99. Raw land, nothing on it, no vineyard, no house, no barn, no garage, wow. no driveway, nothing. What we had that dream from Robert Madonna. So when we started planting the vineyard, we realized you can't plant five acres because you still need one spray rig, one tractor, one uh, yep. plow, et cetera. And so we ended up planting initially 15 acres and then wow. later added another 10. So we have 25 acres. And when this was all started, we were just going to grow grapes. But then my husband and I flew into New York on 9-11 he would have been at the World Trade Center at that time. In the very last minute, they canceled the meeting. And on the way back, we decided we quit our jobs and trust we could learn to make wine. So we're talking oh now God. in 2001, in, in uh, September 2001, that is when we get that mental kick in the rear. And, you know, sometimes you need that in your life where, yeah, you know, it's you so comfortable going to the job every day, sitting yeah. on the freeway, you know, nobody does that <laughs> these days. But yeah. we got that kick with nine eleven. Oh my gosh! It's and I gotta tell you guys, I you know right now I can only imagine how many people are actually getting that kick in some weird way with COVID. And I mean, you guys are reminding me of something that changed the world. So you have nine eleven, that changed your specific world in your own specific way. But at the same time, that changed everybody's you know point of view as far as the way the world looked. And I feel like in some ways that's kind of happening right now for some people. I can only imagine what wineries or brands are going to spot out or, you know, after COVID. Like what's going to happen? Yeah. Like are people going to realize, you know what? This is what's really important to me. This is what I really think I need to do with my life. And that's, I feel like such a great way because um, I mean, one, two, skip a few. You guys, you know, flash forward. Now you guys have been doing this since 2000 one then haven't you guys have been doing this for a long time and the, the wine is amazing how did you guys learn how to make wine that if it, if it came out of a motivation did you have a good tutor or a good you know mentor or who, who taught you well we were in the consulting world and we knew that at that time um our clients you know whatever they needed to do they surrounded themselves with consultants that had the expertise so we knew <laughs> exactly what we needed to do to have consultants around us so we brought in a vineyard manager who was helping us with the vineyard. We brought yeah. in, uh, and it wasn't brought in. They were just literally consulting. We did the work. They didn't do yeah. the work. We did the work. And what we learned over time is we changed through many different winemakers because there was different things we were learning. 
And after mm -hmm. 15 years ago, we decided that we under, under, huh? About 15 years ago. Uh, 15 years ago is when we decided that we really didn't need that many consultants of winemaking that we would then start going with the style that we wanted. Hmm. So it's that makes sense. Now, can I ask you what was the style you guys ended up with? Because I mean, after all these different. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I, was I was going to say after this idea about to so many different people get by leveraging from other people using consultants, and it's still something that we use today because we don't believe that we reach the end of the journey of learning. We're constantly yeah. trying to see how can we get better. How can we learn from the best winemakers we can find out there? Can we still improve on our farming? We're not too sure about that one. We're doing a pretty darn good job. But we really want to all the time to get better. A lot of ongoing experimentation. We can talk next five hours about experiments that we are doing here. <laughs> and I, I feel like being that you guys are from the startup world, that probably that, I think, what, what do they call it? Iteration? I, I feel like you most likely iterate all the time when it comes down to uh, the different types of wine the styles, the, the method. I mean, the fact that you guys can, can say that you're one of the first organic, biodynamic, and sustainable wineries in California already says that you guys have experimented with things that people are now just becoming aware yeah, of. Exactly. And, and yeah, so, so what happened okay. was that after we had finished our second harvest in 2005, we sat down with our vineyard consultant, Jeff Newton, and we said, how can we improve the quality of the grape? There's nothing wrong with the clusters, but can we do it better? And then Jeff said, well, we've done some experimentation with organic biodynamic over at Beckman Great Vineyards, and yes. let's take a look at that together. And then we started reading some of Goethe's work that inspired um, Rudolf Steiner, Steiner's work, and therefore in 06, we said, let's just jump into this. And that was when Rebecca and I started doing that conversion to organic and biodynamic farming wow. and we have we went through the three-year conversion have been certified since 2009 we maintain the certifications every year and the uh sustainability is back in uh 08 roughly or 07 people started using the word sustainable just like they're using yeah. the word natural now there was no right. meaning behind it and peter and i looked at each other and said we know you're not sustainable but there was nothing that would make you know it didn't matter then uh, in the Central Coast, they actually started the first certified auditable sustainability program. And we were the first of the 12 vineyards in that program. Wow. And that's wow. where we know we were the first to be certified in the U.S. in all three certifications because nobody else yeah. in that program was biodynamic. So here's to all you guys out there is that when you go out and you look for those wines, when you talk to Trevor where you get your wines from, look for those certifications, organic, biodynamic, yeah. sustainable, matter because they're important. It tells you something about that the farmer who found it, the winemaker who made the wine, had been going through a rigorous, a long process of looking at all these different parts of farming and learning and improving and constantly is improving their farming to live up to those requirements that they are to maintain the certification. It's really important. It's important for what goes in the class. And one of the, it is. Uh, not so there's no nasty pesticides in our wines at all, but many people don't know what biodynamic is. And real quick, yes. synopsis, you can think of biodynamic as holistic medicine for the earth. So unlike conventional medicine, which is you know using pills and stuff, it's like holistic medicine where we're using mother nature to help improve the soil life. And since we started to biodynamic farming, mm -hmm. we now notice in our vineyard, we have millions and millions and millions of ladybugs and earthworms and the mm -hmm. owls love to hover around our vineyard because everything has got a lot of life in it. That's beautiful. I gotta tell you guys, I by accident, I can tell you from my own experience, that is one of the best feelings in the whole world. We have a compost pile. And I live in basically the center of suburbia in, in the Central Valley. So stucco buildings everywhere. But at the same time, in our backyard, what we've done by accident is created the biggest accidental garden you've ever seen in your life. We've been throwing awesome. all of our produce and other things away on the side yard. 
And now I have a, a pumpkin plant that is basically the size of my six-year-old as far as height and takes up our entire side yard. And there's something really beautiful to notice that previously we never saw any bugs whatsoever. Now, every morning when I walk out, I see nothing but uh, honeybees and I see a bunch of birds and I see all of these things that, that basically represent life. Um, that never existed before. And I feel like that is something that when I think of biodynamic and organic, a lot of times people think about consuming. Like, I, this is what we're doing. We're consuming things that are better for you. That's true. But it also adds life back into what it is you're growing. Like you have earthworms, you have all these bugs, you have this like ecosystem that you guys are actually helping create. That's, I feel like such a, I mean, when you say sustainable, Biodynamic and organic farming, I feel like, is so sustainable. Like, it is something that helps bring life back to Earth. I think that's so cool. And, you know, Trevor, so think about what you are passing on to your six-year-old, because when your kid gets old, he grew up with this whole mindset of taking good care of Earth and seeing those big vegetables just pushing out of the Earth, of the black Earth that you created through your compost. And that's one of the things I want to mention. We're talking about insects. We had, to, we, have a couple of, we had a lot of cool stories, but I'll tell you a couple of what cool stories are. So about yeah, 10 no. years ago, we started seeing down right here below us, down in block 11, when we are picking the grapes. And when we pick the grapes, we hand sort in the vineyard. We have a special sorting table. We sort as we pick the clusters to make sure they're as perfect as possible. Hey, Apollo, make sure you don't flip over the tripod down there, okay? So what we do is we notice the clusters, and we saw 10 years ago, there are little kind of white sticky dew from a little insect called a mealybug in some of the clusters. We're like, what are we going to do now? Start spraying insecticide? And then our foreman found out that these mealybugs have got this symbiotic relationship with the ants. The ants will take care of them when they hurt them. So if you can get rid of the ants, you can get rid of the mealybugs. How do we get rid of ants? Could we spray insecticides? Even better, we brought in a bunch of chicken. So we have two chicken coops here on the ranch right now, where uh, right now our population is low. We only have about 75 chicken, but we just got six new the other morning. I just saw two days ago, six little guys. And we would probably get up to at least 150 chicken. And we let them out in the morning, and the chicken will run in the vineyard. They know where the ants are. They go out yeah. to the ants. Yeah. At 3 o'clock, 3.30, my foreman brings them back in so the coyotes don't get them. And guess what? Five years ago, we didn't have any more mealy bark. So and just a great way. Generation of chickens. Yes, it's just great. You're talking about such a cool people. ecosystem and, 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 of like being able to take care of each other. That 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 is. Yeah. Um, there's a movie recently that I don't know if you've seen, and I recommend it to anybody. It's called The Biggest Little Farm. Have you ever seen that yeah, movie? Or heard oh it? yeah. Great movie. Beautiful great movie. movie. And, and it's about literally what you're describing, guys. Wait, say that again. Want us to talk a little bit about the DNA because. Oh, totally. Sorry. I could talk to you guys all day about this. Why don't you guys uh, tell us about it? So the Viognier, just tell us, I mean, as far as, you know, how you guys have grown it, how you guys made it, and then, you know, let's taste it. So, you know, Viognier is something that not many people knew anything about 20 years ago. When we tasted it for the first time 25 years ago, we tasted a Bob, Bob Lindquist from QP made a Viognier. We're like, what the heck is that? That's great. So we, we started <laughs> Any vineyard, we want to make a little bit of Viognier. We've done that ever since. First of all, Viognier is a white grape from Northern Rhone. It typically grows where Syrah grows. So you got your Comte you got Chateau Villiers, where they're making really great. We are a little bit colder here, but because we have a reliable summer and a fall, we can let the grapes hang for a long time and slowly develop. We bring the grapes in when they taste like peach and apricot. And our goal is to keep those flavors in the wine as we're making it and as we get ready to bottle it. Couple of things okay. about this VNA. Uh, it is biodynamically, it's grapes from biodynamic farming. It comes a little bit from our vineyard, but the yields are so low that we actually buy fruit from a vineyard called Martian, which is certified biodynamic. The other mm. thing we discovered is early on we were buying fruit from a more hot climate area of VNA. That's where they usually think a VNA should be grown. The problem That's is, what I think, but yes. And the problem, yeah, the problem is that is the VNA that people don't like because it's too flowery. It's got way too much perfume. If it comes from the cool area, 
it doesn't have that flowery perfumey it's much more like the stone fruit which is what mm. we really love about and, DNA. And the other thing about the colder climate is, beside a longer hang time, is that it retains its acidity. What happens when the grapes get hot, they can burn acidity off. Mm. All acidity in this wine, which is a great acidity level, is all natural acidity. A couple of other things is, as we make the wine in the winery, we keep it cold. So we keep it right around 50 degrees, and thereby mm. we slow down fermentation. And yes. by doing that, some of those flavor components are called volatile esters, and that's those peach, apricots, pineapple mm. flavors. So we keep that in the well, wine so they don't happens, burn off. Most people don't realize most fermentations are in the high 80s degrees, and mm. as it gets hotter, it will actually burn off the fruit. So you lose mm. that. Like you yes. get cold at 55, we're not burning any of that off from the heat of the fermentation. It stays in stainless steel. This wine. Okay. Yeah, it was bottled up in January, so that's basically like three months, four months after the grapes were picked, it's already in a bottle. It doesn't go through any aging and oak barrels. We don't want to disturb it with the oak. We don't want to disturb it with the malolactic fermentation. We want to keep mm. that crisp apple acidity, the malic acidity in the wine. Well, what we think is that v &A has so much going on for itself that if you put oak on it, it's kind of like the third man out, odd man. It just <laughs> Yeah. No, totally. No, when you have a good couple on a nice date, you don't want to add a third person. It, it's it's true. It, I, I totally agree. Exactly. <laughs> no, this is, I do. And guys, so I totally agree with you too. When I when I think of VNA, I do not actually think of what I'm tasting now. Like this is such like you said, stone fruit forward. Like I'm I'm tasting so much more than what I normally taste. Where VNA in the Past can almost be described to me as like a blending grape or something that I haven't had independently, but something that's been added to something else, another more popular white varietal to, you know, add whatever characteristic they want. But this really stands alone. And man, I taste the fruit. I actually thought, I, I'm so sorry, I thought there was oak involved because there's so much fruit here and it's such a big mouthfeel. I didn't realize it was actually, no, it's just when you grow the grapes in a good cl cold climate that allows for this fruit to, uh, to, to, to actually show rather than just being burnt off. That's amazing. That is really amazing. So one of the things we like to do is um, when we drink a wine, we do a little ding. Now you are in Rebecca's corner. In Rebecca's kitchen corner. <laughs> you, know, you know what? People are always asking, so what would you pair this with? I get, right. I have so many people who want me to make a cookbook, but there's no way I will do that. Not enough time. <laughs> oh, if I pour you a little wine, would you want to write I know. Let's, let's try and get you to say that after, after, uh, after we taste the other two bottles. We'll ask you again. Well, you know, the obvious one everybody will pair it with is seafood, oysters, that kind of thing. Yeah. And that sounds really exciting. Seafood, oysters. Well, I, you know how I like to cook. I like to be a little different. I'm a little bit no eclectic. Kidding. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I often will make a pasta dish that's actually made out of, if you can get like four different kinds of mushrooms, wild mushrooms, or just yeah. different kinds of mushrooms. And it's a cream sauce that I put a little bit of uh, sherry into, just a hint. And it just balances out so well with the oh. uh, v &A. And, you know, of course, peppers and onions. And I sometimes I'll throw papers in there, depending on how I feel. So. That sounds perfect. Guys, uh, I don't mean to say I planned this, but actually right before I started this, I was finishing my dinner, and it was mushroom pasta. It was not actually all those different types of mushroom pasta. At the same time, like, as I'm drinking this, I'm just like, yes. That is exactly what what tastes so what good to me. It sounds like that's, that's 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 Well, you know what's nice is the mushrooms have that earthiness. Yeah. And the VNA doesn't have that earthiness, but mushrooms don't have acid, and the VNA has acid. So it's kind of go. like an opposite thing attracting to each other. Yes, it, it, it does complement each other so well when it comes down to it, especially because I think of, you know, uh, Mushrooms as that umami, kind of earthy, like you say, and, you know, being able to get something to cut through that and break it up with the acid, I feel like is perfect. Hey, I have to ask you, now that the sun is setting, do you guys want to do a little uh, scene change or do you guys want to stay out there a little bit longer? 
I mean, what, what do you think? Is it getting too dark now? What would you like? You know what? Dark? I was going to say, it, it's getting a little bit dark right now. So if you guys want, I think this could be a perfect time, and then we'll still have plenty of time for the other wine. Uh, you got it. You know what? Hey, if it's okay, um, I'm going to uh, have you guys join again in just a second. You guys go ahead and climb uh, inside, and then I'll ask you to join in just a few minutes. Okay, it's fine. You can keep us on. Okay, you guys get to now have a full, uh, I guess, tour of uh, Ambulus Sellers, guys. Hey, what I was saying to you earlier, as they're moving inside, everybody that's watching, um, if you haven't yet, there's a movie that I would recommend to anybody that's interested in farming called The Biggest Little Farm. It's such a good movie. It is about uh, basically a couple that moved to a certain part of California and created a farm that is self-sustaining in a lot of ways you have uh all the animals working with then the plants that work with the bugs that balance everything out and it's really beautiful so yes if you haven't seen it yet and you're interested in some of the stuff that we're actually talking about tonight biodynamic sustainably farmed organic that stuff it, it does so much more than make your food taste good it actually helps mother earth out just a little bit more than you realize. So if you haven't yet, take a look at biggest little farm. It's such a cool movie. And it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's just fun. I mean, for me, it's also super relaxing because so many, like basically you're watching this couple bring life back to earth rather than a stressful, you know, rom-com or something like that. You're actually watching just a really good movie about somebody helping mother. Somebody earth. Helping mother earth. So, anyway. Anyway. Uh, and guys, for everybody else too that is joining, we're talking to Amplos Sellers, and we're, we're going through three wines tonight. Right now, we just have the Viognier, which is an outstanding stone fruit forward, great Viognier that doesn't have any oak. It is just really straightforward as far as uh, what the white wine uh, and the grapes that are made from, that they're made from, what they taste like. And then we're going to go through two other ones tonight as well, the Pinot Noir, as well as what I want to call sriracha, but I think it's actually called, uh, sir how, Rebecca, how do you pronounce it? It's not sriracha. So it's a, it's a play on words. You say sriracha, sriracha. Sriracha. See, and which is great. We, but again, I like spicy food. So I want to say sriracha. Great, the sriracha yeah, we, is the way you're supposed to pronounce it. Just for trademark sriracha. purposes, I'm sure. Yeah, we trademarked it before the hot sauce. If we knew about the hot sauce, we would have trademarked it under the hot sauce. But now we're going to talk about the king of the grapes. No, this no, is the no, important no. thing. Now we're going to talk about Pinot Noir. So just to clarify, Peter's the Pinot person, and I'm the Rome lover. So you go. notice tonight we're having two Romes and only one Pinot. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good you know, Okay, so we're looking at the 2015 Lambda Pinot Noir. So let's go. talk a little bit about Pinot Noir. Because it's the best grape. And you'll talk a long time to Pinot Noir. <laughs> that is, it is so good. So think about it. Pinot Noir is, first of all, Pinot Noir makes the most expensive wines in the world, period. So 33 of the 50 that most expensive. the best one. 33 of the 50 <laughs> most expensive wines in the world. And a good amount of those are Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is a very sensitive grape. So we got well, to play it up here. Be left alone and you don't have to do anything to it. It's <laughs> easy. <laughs> guys, I want you to know you didn't do this yet. Hey, Rebecca, Peter, guys, hold on. We didn't do this yet. We're now in Peter's corner. Uh, just just to be clear. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Go ahead, Peter. So what Pinot Noir is, it's a sensitive grape. It needs some heat, but not too much heat. It needs some moisture, but not too much. So where we are right here, you saw the vineyard before. If we drive 10 minutes east, we get down to Buta, too warm for Pinot Noir. If we go 20 minutes west to Blanco, too cold for Pinot Noir. So we have this little microclimatic area here that was discovered in the 70s by Richard Sanford as he was driving around trying to find the ideal conditions for Burgundy grapes. So vineyards in this area, we used to say they're young vineyards, but that's 20 years ago when we moved here. Now they're not that young any longer. Within Pinot Noir family, we could talk about this for many hours. There are different types of Pinot Noir. We call them clones. This wine yeah. is made with seven different clones of Pinot Noir, but they're all from the vineyards. Right and just here. to clarify, clones, 
if you think about Syrah and Pinot, it's like apples and oranges. Yeah. And then within the apple family, you have Granny Smith's Bread, Delicious, Fiji, etc. Those are clones in the Pinot. And the clones do have different flavors, profiles, just like every apple has a different flavor profile. I totally understand, guys, especially because you guys are talking to an identical twin right now. So if you want to talk to anybody about clones, I actually am a personal expert on cloning. Um, my twin brother uh, is nothing like me. You could say he's a completely different flavor, even though he looks similar and comes from the same stock. So I, I want you to know, I totally understand what you're talking about. But you both have the moustache, right? No, well, well I, I did. I did, Peter. It's gone now. I don't have the moustache anymore, yeah. unfortunately. So the, another part of the wine here. So the Pinot Noir has got relatively long hang time here. Like we talked a little bit about the Viognier. Hmm. And day, this is 100% from our vineyard. Our days That's are true. remarkably shorter here than in Burgundy because we're closer to the equator. So in the middle of the summer, there are more hours of sunlight in Burgundy that we have here, and that means our grapes are ripening a little bit slower. But we can mm -hmm. let them hang into the fall, typically we get into easily into September before we pick Pinot Noir. These are all hand-picked, they are all, everything is done by hand along the way. It is, as we mentioned, seven different clones. We mm -hmm. do uh, small fermenters, we do careful uh, fermentation with a little bit of pop over in the beginning, then two daily mm -hmm. punch downs. As we go through the fermentation, afterwards we let the grapes sit on the skins in up to a month in what's called extended maceration. We go through it, Rebecca and I taste through the fermenters to find out if that batch is ready to go to barrel. Once it gets to the barrels, we, uh, for this wine, the Lambda, it was uh, bottled uh, exactly two years ago, and that means that it had about two and a half years of barrel aging. So we like to age our wines where a lot of wineries will be releasing 18s and some 19s now. Yes. And we're not. We're actually, it's our current vintage. We like to bottle age them a long time and barrel age them, so we're aging them for you. But more importantly, why we're doing it is rather than rack the wines, which is removing the wines out of the barrel and putting them back, which introduces yes. oxygen and is an yes. artificial way of aging wines, we don't do that. They don't get racked. They just have to sit in the barrel just like the French do. Let it take its time. Yes. We, uh, keep it, we keep it in the barrels for that duration. The barrels we are using are all French oak barrels. It's about 30% okay. new oak barrels. So what we do is we work with six different coopers in France, barrel builders in France, small family typically, that will help us to select the barrels that fits the individual clones the best. So that as they go through this, uh, two and a half years of barrel aging, we reach a kind of the right balance between the oak flavors and the integrity of the grapes themselves. And guys, I'm going to interrupt here real quick, though, too. I, I have to point out that you guys are, are, are going through uh, many details that highlight what I would say a very impressive process. Because what we have here is a, a grape that is organic and biodynamically farmed. So we don't have the same, like uh, what I would say, um, the things that would normally keep things stable artificially. You have a really live uh, bean. You have something that can grow into whatever. And then from there, you leave it alone for, for years. And that says a lot actually to your process because a lot of times when you have something that is organic, and biodynamic, it can't handle that kind of, well, just leave it alone. Like a lot of times, like when you do stuff like that, you know, nature grows things and it turns into a lot of different things. You have a control system. I don't know how you've done it, but at the same time, your control system to be able to do this has created a wine that is so consistent. Cause I'm like, this wine, like I've had more than one bottle of your wine. And let me say that it is so consistent whenever I have it. Like it has been, like I, I was surprised when I learned from Amanda that this is as, like you say, biodynamic and organically farmed as you, you have it. Cause like, this is not like what I've experienced in the past where normally when you have that, it's woo, it's just everywhere. Like, it, like you know, it's, Trevor, just to add one more, just to add one more thing to it that we yeah. haven't talked about yet is that we also are doing what's called natural wines. 
So the way that we make it, we believe that when the grapes are picked, they have so much integrity because we haven't manipulated it with a bunch of crappy pesticides out of the vineyards yeah. that there's a lot of great microbes, a lot of yeast and whatever on the skins. So therefore, we don't need to add yeast in the, for, for the fermentation. It's all mm. natural yeast that's on yeah. the skins when we pick it. The same when it goes in the barrel, it goes through the second fermentation, malolactic. We don't need to add malolactic bacteria. We just mm -hmm. add mother nature to do the job. But one of the things um, we're doing, to your point about we're not manipulating our wines or adding chemicals, so how do we make sure, because it is a fruit product, that it doesn't go bad. Right. And that is one of the things is we're very anal about keeping our winery clean and pristine because that's how you get bacteria. So, uh, and for those that don't know the technical term, anal means that you're very strict with all of the things that you do to wipe it down. Anyway, I just want to make sure people know the winery <laughs> technical term. Yeah. I, 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 that's yeah, a technical so, you know, term. I want people to know yeah, that's what that means. Sorry, keep going though. So our our uh, floor space is washed a minimum of four to six times a year. Most wineries will wash the inside of their barrel when they empty the wines, but they don't wash the outside of the barrel, and we scrub the outsides down. So what we're doing is we're really keeping it extremely clean inside the winery so that uh, there isn't bacteria that can get in it, and we don't have to use chemicals. Wow. One of the things about this wine is that, so Pinot Noir is, no matter what she says, Pinot Noir is two-thirds of our production. It's the main thing that we produce. We make four different Pinot Noirs. Um, they're all now 100% estate grapes. But what's really cool is that once a year, Rebecca and I and our assistant winemaker, Jesse, who works for us, we will taste through all the barrels in a batch. We did that for the 2017 barrels just about a month ago. It takes us about two mornings, typically 60, That's 70 job. barrels. A lot of hard work, a lot of spitting. Yeah, a lot of spitting. Otherwise, we wouldn't make it too long. And some, probably some mornings. napping. Probably some napping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what we do is we taste the way we're down to three hours. We, give, if we discuss the bell and we give it a point score. And based on that, we select which bells are going to go into which of the different batches of wines that we're making. Yeah. So it's not about a formula. It's not about it has to have 50% you know, of clone one, six, yeah. uh, six, six, seven. Yeah, yeah, for that. Yeah. It's, not, it's all about three of us tasting and evaluating and then deciding which bell is used for which project. Very yes. exciting work to pick up. That has to be very so, exciting because you don't know. You don't know what the barrels are going to turn into until you taste them. Okay. And then you get to be introduced to whatever it is nature created from your extremely natural winemaking process. That sounds really exciting, actually. And one of the things you'll notice on our labels that we've moved to and have done it for a few years, one of the things that bothered us was the fact that there's, there's about 60 different chemicals wineries can use in their uh, wines without oh, yeah. uh, just label. So we moved to an in ingredients listing on the back of our label where we're telling Oh my gosh! Guys, exactly guys, guys, I will say right now, I have never seen ingredients listed on, on a wine label before. I've never seen that before, but there are ingredients listed on this wine list. I've never seen that. It's because we want to be honest about it. We want to tell people out there, tell yeah, your customers. I, have chill. I, I can't believe I have chills about something like this. This is ridiculous. I've never seen this before. I mean, you don't see this with beer. You don't see this with alcohol at all. Yeah, so just let everybody know, sorry, this wine's ingredients is hand harvested biodynamic and sustainable farmed grapes, 4% water with tartaric acid. Tartaric acid is a natural product. Native yeast, native malolactic bacteria, oak flavors, and minimal effective sulfites. So we use little sulfites in our wines, but you have to have sulfites, otherwise the wines will not age. That's true. And guys, I will say that most of the bottled water I buy has more ingredients than this. Just to, just to throw that out there. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, and, and I'm just saying, you, I'm pretty sure you can't even pronounce it. I definitely right? cannot say the same thing as this. So, uh, that is amazing. That is really cool. And, and really, I mean, again, for those that are not necessarily making wine, that's not required. 
That is not something that anybody that makes wine needs to do. That is something that is purely voluntary that these guys are doing right now because of what they believe in. I am, I am literally really humbled right now that you guys have done like that's that's amazing that is really really cool so thank you thank you for doing that and and i don't want to push it because i know that we're right now you know in peter's corner and i don't want to push it back to rebecca's but should we taste the last last wine yeah and just to let you know oh yeah are we going to do the food pairing what would you cook with this so oh yes just to let you know one thing is that wines is the only thing that doesn't require the ingredients listing or the panel and the one reason is this every single thing out there on this earth has an ingredient or is a recipe beer is a recipe spirits sure. is a recipe everything's a recipe and the problem is the test to do those panels and the ingredients is extremely expensive because there's only a couple labs that can do them and because we're not a recipe, we would have to do it for every single vintage, for every single wine, which is very, very, very expensive. And that's been the dilemma of why wines have not yet gone that direction. There's one more thing I would like to cover here too, that is packaging, very important. Because a lot of the wines you buy out there are put in glass, God knows where that's made. The least expensive glass we can buy comes actually not from here, but from China. God sure. knows how they make glass from China. You can get glass from Mexico, it might be okay. Yeah. We don't want to do that because of the CO2 footprint from transportation, child labor, God knows how they make. We make, uh, we only use glass that's made in California. And that's what all these bottles are. They're made in California and they're made with a very high percentage of recycled glass material. About 70%. About 70%. Oh, wow. So when, we, when you take your bottles and put it into the recycling container, a lot of that actually is bought by these glass manufacturers that makes this great glass. It's made, this is made in Modesto by it's part of Gallo. They have their own manufacturing plant. That's awesome. Second thing is no foils. Yeah, G3, exactly. Uh, yes. No foils. That is a waste of metal. Metal is just going out there. Nobody recycles metal from a glass, from a bottle. So it's a complete waste. The paper we're using is made uh, of a printed company uses recycled paper material. And the corks we're using- And we require them to move to recycled paper in order to keep our business. And they do that. Mm. The corks we're using are DM corks. And we all know there are problems with it. Wines are being caught, it had uh, TCA. Yeah, TCA, right. And it, and it was just nasty stuff that destroyed the wine we had one just yes. recently. We moved to these corks about 10 years ago, DM corks, and they are rock solid. We never had a cork wine with these. They're very, very good corks. And the other yes. thing is that they're made with cork material from the cork trees in Portugal that yes. they caught the bark of them every eight to 10 years. And they grind it up, they have a very high usage of the cork material, like 98%. They grind it up, they treat it with high pressure, high temperature, recycle CO2, so there'll never be TCA in them. We don't even, when we pop these wines, we don't even smell or taste them to make sure they're okay. We know they're okay. So this yeah, is just no, our focus guys, on I, I have had the privilege before this of being a supply chain manager for a large winery, and I have interviewed the people that were selling those corks. And I can tell you, they are the most upstanding people that I've ever like interacted with in the business setting. They're yep. such a cool business. I mean, and and actually, you know what? Hey, I found an old picture of you guys. Uh, actually, I think this is I think this is Peter. Uh, there he is. Uh, that's Captain Planet. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what you looked like. I don't know if you remember when you used to wear speedos and that, but basically, you were the one that was. Yeah, yeah, well, was that what I had brought here? That was you, wasn't it? I mean, just to, just to be clear, I mean, like you literally have now done yeah. everything you could possibly do to make this wine better for the planet every single time you make a bottle. Like, okay, recycled glass, the corks that go in it, the labels, uh, the wine, the way that you guys produce the grapes. I mean, like, in all honesty, guys, I, I really, I got to tell you, like, as a father, I appreciate this. Thank you. Like, you know, because like you're able to then like help out, being able to let people know like, hey, there's other ways to do it. Like you are able to make wine, you're able to produce things that people want in a way that it actually is good, not just for the people buying it, 
but for Earth. And I, I, I got to tell you, like, that is, that is amazing. So thank you. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And I now feel so humbled to say, like, do you guys want to have the third bottle? <laughs> Yeah. Like, that is uh, uh, I mean, I thought it would be the marriage going here. So we have to go to her wine. Yes, here, so, here it is. So just to let you know, we have a saying that we live by. You didn't inherit the planet from your parents. It's on loan to you from your kids. Yeah. And that's what I we do. fully agree. Yeah, this, this, concept fully agree. Of taking the, this concept of taking the best care of. Rebecca and I were lucky enough to... to you know, 20 years ago, we are lucky enough to buy this beautiful piece of land. So we own a part of Mother Earth, not a big part, but a little bit. But we feel it is our responsibility to make sure, like Rebecca was saying with the uh, Amish uh, proverb, that what we give on to the next generation is better than what we started with. So you wanted us to move on to the Sirach, as we call it, Sirach. It's the Sirach <laughs> Sirach. And it was yeah. early on one night, Peter and I had quite a bit to drink, and we finally figured out, we kept saying Syrah Grenache, and it all went together. Yeah, Syrah Grenache, drink, Syrah Grenache, drink, Syrah Grenache, and it became Syrah. And it is trademarked. So it's 70% Syrah and 30% Grenache in it. The reason we don't add Mavedra is um, we haven't really found a California Mavedra we'd like, but more importantly, I think Syrah and Grenache are twins and we're meant to be together. And it's back to that odd man out, thirds of crowd. And it, yeah. to me, my veggies just sticks out. I just don't care for it in a Syrah Grenache blend. So, Can I be so bold, little... Rebecca, in all honesty, you don't need it. I don't know why you would add anything to this wine. I opened this wine the I other day and I realized that I feel horrible that I listed it for sale. Like that's that's how I felt ah. about my wine. I was like, I don't want to sell this. I don't want to sell this at all. This is amazing. My wife even tasted it, who is mainly uh, actually, you know, a primarily Pinot drinker. And she's like, oh, my gosh, is this a Pinot? I'm like, no, it's not a Pinot. It's not. No, it's, it's for Grenache. This is, a, this is a blend. But, like, it is just such a good, I think, balance of, of, of red wine. Like, when you taste it, I'm like, this is exactly what I think of, like, I want a good red wine at the end of the day, and I want to be able to relax. This is, in my oh, mind, even if I can't describe it, what I expect to drink. Like, this is such a good blend. I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I've poured at events, and I've had people come to the table and say, I only drink white wine, and I'll go, well, you got to try this. you got to try it. Um, and they would come back, and I say, you can spit it out, you can tell me you hate it. It doesn't bother me because I like it. And they will come back and say, this is the first red wine they've ever liked. I call it a safe dinner party wine. There you because go. Because it can go with a very large food profile. If you're at a dinner in a restaurant, which some are now starting to happen, if somebody's ordered fish and somebody's ordered steak, et cetera, this wine can go with every single of those um, items. So think I about... What, what, and we've been telling you guys, that these are from our vineyard, right? 100% from our vineyard. Pinot Noir, Syrah, Grenache. Isn't that kind of weird because Pinot Noir is Burgundy and Syrah is like Northern Rome. It's Grenache. actually really weird. It is weird. You're right. I mean, like, not in a weird bad way, but impressive. Like, how did you do that? It's like colder, warmer, even warmer. The reason why we can do that is, again, it's back to the weather because we don't have a risk of getting hailstorms and rains and whatever coming in in August, September. We can just let the great hang. And what happens with them is that in the spring, in like March, early March, Pinot starts doing butt break. Survive so Grenache, they're still sleeping, they're still dormant. Three, four, five weeks later, they start doing butt break. Right now in the vineyards, a Pinot Noir is done with flowering, pretty much all done with fruit set. We'll see berry growth. The Syrah just started flowering a week ago. The Grenache is kind of getting started. The same thing happens through the rest of the year. So when we get into a harvest, Pinot Noir, that's like I mentioned before, it's September time frame. We don't pick Syrah in September, that's into October. And sometimes Grenache can be into November. We pick Grenache as late as the 30th of November, that was in 2010. Wow. But because we have this great climate, we can let these three grapes hang there and develop the right flavors and pick them 
when we believe that the favors are right. Okay. okay, I mean, do you guys work for the Tourist Bureau? Because I'm like, you guys are really arguing for people to come visit you. And actually, while I have you, uh, can I ask, I mean, where are you guys? Because I know that the world is going to open up again. So can you let people know, where are you guys? Where can they come visit you guys? Well, currently, uh, we have a taste room in the wine ghetto. It's called, it's in Lompoc. Uh, it's an industrial area. It's really just husbands and wives. There's no corporations, not a big companies there. They're small. It is so wine. cool. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't play it down, Rebecca. Like that is, it is such an approachable place with great wine. Keep going. No, no, keep going. Yeah, it's just, it's small um, husband and wife teams. And so we're in the ghetto. We currently in our tasting room, people can come in and pick up their wine club shipments or purchase wines. Of course, we can't do tastings yet. Uh, we're hoping that when stage three opens up in California, then uh, we'll be able to start doing uh, tastings again. We just don't know when that will be. Absolutely. And, you could purchase the wines through you. Hey, you know what? And actually, I, this I, I have a few of your wines. And, but at the same time, I do want to encourage everybody watching. Like one of the record guys, the, the, the point of Bricks and Barrel is not just to sell wine. It's actually to connect people to people like you who are making great wine. So if you love their story and you want to buy their wine, go ahead, buy it for me. You can, that's fine. I'll, I'll take care of, you know, shipping and logistics. But if you want to, you can also buy directly from them. I, I would be just as happy, if not more happy, if you did that. So, I mean, as far as that goes, I mean, it, you know, I, I really do want to encourage people. Like, I only have a few of your wines, but you guys have all of your wines. So, I'm like, if you don't, if, if you want to try something, make sure to go to their website, Amplos. And, and just to uh, dial in on geography a uh, little bit more on that. So where we are located is we are about two and a half hours northwest of Los Angeles. As you drive on one on one, we are about 45 minutes northwest of Santa Barbara, out in the Santa Ynez Valley, out in the western end, the cool ends, Santa Rita Hills in the western it's part of it. Cool people or cool weather? Cool all, cool everything, <laughs> cool everything. The, the, another thing I Should want I just talk about how we make this first. Yeah. <laughs> so the Syrah, like the Pinot, um, with the Syrah and Grenache, we actually barrel age it for about three years. So we're aging it longer. Wow. And that's because the Syrah just takes, Syrah just takes a long time to finally get through to really be smooth and, and you know, just really smooth is what we're looking for. The interesting thing with Grenache, it's the one grape that uh, when it's fermenting, we don't let it go dry in the fermenter because it'll get too tannic. And so we remove it out of the fermentation with about 5% when yeah, it's- Yeah, because the tannins comes from the skins and the skins in grass are very thick. Yeah. So that's why if it sits too long, the skins will get, like Rebecca said, high tech. That's not a problem with Pinot because it has a thin skin. So you see, as it goes through fermentation, when it gets below 5% residual sugar, we call it bricks. That's typically mm -hmm. when we'll drain it out first and let it finish up in the tank. And it does finish dry. So it's not that we're leaving the sugar on it. We just need to get it off the skins before yeah. it's totally dry. Otherwise, it's too tannic. Right. Um, we used an interesting thing on the Rome program. Um, we used both American and French oak. Unlike the Pinots is just the French oak. Yeah. So we think it needs a little bit of American. And we use these barrels that are called hybrids, where yes. the heads are Americans and the face are French. And yeah. I like to say for the years that they're in the barrel, they're duking it out until the Americans and the French get <laughs> integrated. And so yeah. we like that program. It sounds like the things and the Americans duking it out. <laughs> I mean, probably much and, more important, then, yeah. And this has about, this was about 20, 30% 30, uh, 30 new oak on it as well. Yeah, 15. just maybe about 4 or 5% American oak. So just a tiny, I mean, usually what we get out of American oak is a tiny bit of coconut. And we don't want yes. it to be too overwhelming. But just a little hint of that is kind of nice on the wine. We like that. Well, and the American oak helps, I think, more than the French oak because it's such a light oak. French oak is really soft, 
but the American oak is kind of hard. And with that little bit, it actually helps on the tannin structure of the Syrah and the Grenache. Mm -hmm. So when people yeah. taste our Syrah and our Grenache or this Syrah, they're blown away because it's very elegant. It's yeah. almost like a Burgundian style wine. And we don't like our wines to become the meal in themselves. We want it to be no. part of it. So we didn't yeah. want these Syrah and are just big in your face. So what, no, what are I gotta tell you guys know? that, like in general, your your wines actually have the right amount of acid. Where, like, I can imagine food, pretty much with, I mean, like with all the wines. I mean, I, I imagine it directly with this wine because I was having, you know, pasta with mushrooms <laughs> right beforehand, and then being able to have the pinot, and then the sriracha, yeah. whatever you want to call it. I want to call it sriracha, but at the same time, like all of these guys, <laughs> have a lot of acid with them. It allows for good uh, food pair. I mean, I, I, I think that all of them really, I mean, different food, but all of them really do pair perfectly. And guys, I have to warn you, we only have a couple minutes left before Instagram cuts us off. So there were a few questions that popped up I wanted to be able to ask you if it's okay. One, Peter, do you ever do voiceovers for any books? <laughs> ah, 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 ah. Uh, I, I do it all the time, and we have never been able to publish. No, I don't. No. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then also the last question, though, I do want to ask you guys, though, is in your opinion, though, how do you think we can be helping out as many people as possible during this time? So whether it's restaurants, whether it's those in need, we always try and be able to uh, ask that question at the end. Uh, to be able to figure out, like, hey, in your opinion, from what you've seen, what do you think we should be doing to be able to help as many people as possible during COVID and during this time as we're starting to open and things are kind of unknown? Is there any opinion that you have as far as, like, hey, what do you think we should be doing for each other to, to help make this place a little bit better? I, I would say number one is be more flexible, be more friendly, help each other out. Let's not be rough on each other. Let's help each other out as much as we can. It's a difficult yeah. thing to go through. We've seen yeah. how our landlords have been helping us a little bit on the rent. We are now helping on distribution with lower prices. Yeah, we, we yes. really need to help each other out. We did a fantastic thing about six weeks ago, Trevor. You're going to appreciate this. Where one of the local guys, he had a little, wine, wine guy, he had a little extra time. He said, I want to help out the, the wow. responders down in Los Angeles because they have a stressful time right now. They need a bottle of wine. Within four days, he managed to gather 500 cases of wines. You all dedicated. Cases? Yeah, you all dedicated so six be, uh, vans. The and they was, drove a caravan they down hey, to how LA. How would you know that is an essential service? That is an that essential is service, guys. Yeah. That was, the intent was to make sure every doctor and nurse got a bottle of wine, so they needed like mm -hmm. 500 cases. We gave a pallet of wine for it. Oh, yeah. God. So yes. the thing is that we, we all got to help each other out. We all got to yeah. be a little more flexible. If we have something we can give, give it to your friends, give it to your neighbors, help each other out, out there. We are all going to get through this, and we are all going to be better human beings at the end of the day. We really need to work together on making this a better world. I love it. I love it. And I feel like you're doing it right now in the way that you make wine, as well as the way that you guys produce your business. Because they are not saying it, but I have actually heard from Amanda and others all of the things that you guys are doing to make sure that you guys not only are keeping the lights on, you're taking care of your employees, the people that work with you. Guys, you're doing an amazing job, and thank you. Really, thank you. thank you. And I can't in like emphasize enough how much I I would love for people to be able to buy your wine, buy it from me, but also buy it from these guys as well. So, <sighs> Becca, so Peter, guys, work. thank you. It, it's been thank so you. good to, to be able. To, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Trevor, for putting this on. I really appreciate. It. Love your passion, love your support. That's awesome. And to you guys out there. You know, when you go out and buy that bottle of wine, we talk about it all evening, is that request the right wines that's farmed the right way. Support the farmers out there. We're trying to do the best that we can. And when you ever come down to St. Rita Hills, come out here and visit us. We'd love to hang out with you, okay? Thank you so that's much for perfect. having us. 
That is perfect. Guys, we now have 15 seconds left. And all I want to say is thank you. And for everybody here, please make sure to follow Amplos Sellers. And next week, we're going to be.